Hello, so this is a GCSE Combined Science Trilogy Path Paper Walkthrough. This is for Biology Paper 2, uh, Foundation Tier, and this was the paper that was sat in June 22. Okay, so I'm going to go through it, model it, how I would have tackled it, and I've attached the revision video from Cognito on the topics if you need to go back and revise those topics before you try a similar question. Okay, so question one then. This question is about genetics. Crop plants are genetically modified, GM, for useful characteristics. Which useful characteristics are crops genetically modified for? Would they be modified for fewer roots, larger yields, or smaller fruits? So basically, which one is actually useful? We're having smaller roots, that wouldn't help a plant and help it grow. That's not useful. And giving smaller fruits isn't useful. So it is larger yield. Yield is the amount of food, basically, you get from the plant. What is one concern about GM crops? GM crops will add to global warming. GM crops will cause air pollution. GM crops will harm wildlife. Or GM crops will provide too much food. Well... We're not worried about too much food being produced. We generally need more food as the population gets bigger. And crops by themselves aren't contributing to global warming and don't produce air pollution. So it's just for general concern that if they get out, they could be unforeseen side effects on the animals that then eat them. Some inherited disorders are caused by a faulty piece of DNA. What is the name of a piece of DNA that codes for a characteristic? So you should know that DNA is for double helix shape. What is the name for a small part of DNA that codes for a feature? And that is just a gene. You are also allowed to say alleles because alleles are versions of genes. DNA contains a code for making substances in the cell. What type of substance is made using that DNA code? Well, that DNA, that gene in the double helix shape, this information is transferred in the ribosomes to a protein. So remember, genes encode proteins, and it's the proteins that give us our physical features like hair colour, eye colour. Cystic fibrosis is an inherited disorder. The allele for having cystic fibrosis is recessive, little h. The allele for not having cystic fibrosis is dominant, big H. What is a recessive allele? Is it always expressed? Is it an allele that is only expressed if one copy is present? Or is it an allele that is only expressed if two copies are present? So if we think recessive, recessive is basically weaker. It's the weaker of the genes. So therefore, it's not always going to be expressed. If you've only got one copy, so you've got a big H and a little h, then obviously the big H would be shown. So it's not shown if one copy is present, it is only shown if two copies are present. Okay, so it would be the bottom one here. So recessive only shown if there is no dominant. A man and a woman do not have cystic fibrosis. The man has the allele big H little h. What word describes the alleles of the man? Well, because they are different versions of the same gene, different alleles, it is hetero. Hetero means different. So when you've got different versions of the same allele, big H, little h. Homozygous means the same. So it would be little h, little h, or big H, big H would be homozygous. And the phenotype is what you physically see. Okay, so it's do they have cystic fibrosis, yes or no? Or if it was hair colour, do they have brown hair or blonde hair? That would be their phenotype. The man and the woman want to have a child. Complete figure one to show the possible genotypes of the child. Draw a ring around the genotype of a child who would have cystic fibrosis. So you, what we would then do is combine the different squares together. So big H, big H, big H, little h. Big H, little h, and then little h, little h. You don't need to draw those hours on, that's just showing where you get the letters from. Okay, so that gives us these four different possible genotypes. 
Now, for one that would have cystic fibrosis, because it's recessive, it's when it has two um, recessive alleles. So it would be the two little H's. What is the chance of the child, uh, that the child of the man and woman will have cystic fibrosis? Is it 25, 50, 75 or 100? If we go back to our diagram, we see we've got a 1 in 4 chance of having it. The others all have normal non-cystic fibrosis genes that are effectively protecting them. So there's only a 1 in 4 chance, which would be a 25% chance. Then, question 1.9. A woman is pregnant. The woman can have embryo screening to find out if the child would have cystic fibrosis. Suggest one reason why the woman might not want to have embryonic screening. Okay, but there is a risk if you're screening embryos, it could harm the embryo. If you take a couple of cells out to have a look at its DNA to see if it's going to have the d disease, it might harm it. Okay, you could also then cause a miscarriage. Okay, or generally they don't want to, um, you could say it's against their religious beliefs. You could also say they do not want to make a choice about having an abortion. Right, question number two then. So on a school field, one area of the soil was usually very wet. Another area of the soil was usually very dry. Students investigated the effect of water in the soil on the number of buttercup plants growing in each area. On the field, the students marked out an area 10 by 10 of wet soil and 10 by 10 of dry soil. Describe how a quadrat could be used to measure the size of a buttercup population on the area of wet soil, on the wet soil area. Okay, so it's basically our required practical. How do I estimate the number of um, buttercups in this situation? in 10, cent, uh, 10 by 10 of wet soil. So imagine it, this is my field, and it's 10 metres by 10 metres of the wet soil. I'm going to use my quadrat, which is my small one metre by one metre grid, okay? So that is what a quadrat is. Hopefully you've gone out to the school field and used them. And then you've got to describe how you would do it. So what you've got to say is you would place your quadrat, okay, and you've got to say you place your quadrat randomly at different places on the field. Now, you got can say, you get an extra point for saying how you get to it randomly. I would say you divide up the field into grids, of one meter by one meter and use a random number generator to um, choose where it goes or choose where to place it. So one mark for saying you put your quadrat down randomly and one mark for saying how you chose it randomly. Once it is down, you would count the number of buttercup plants in that area, and you would record the number. Okay, you would then repeat it a certain number of times. Maybe do it in 10 areas. And then you would, after you've done it 10 times, you would calculate a mean. And that would give you an answer, a calculated mean per metre squared. Well, we don't want an answer per metre squared. So you would times or calculate or times the mean by the area of the field to get an estimate. 
So you get your, your area, you measure out your area, you get your quadrat, you divide it up and use a random number generator to choose at what specific places you're going to put it on the field. You go around, you count out how many buttercups there are. Okay, you can do it a certain number of times. 10 is always a good number. You then calculate the mean of that 10 areas and then you times it by the area of the field. Now, because you've been told the area of the field is 10 by 10, it's basically just timesing it by 100 because 100 is your area. Okay, what type of factor is water in the soil? So it's but basically, this is testing, do you know the difference between a biotic factor and an abiotic factor? Biotic factors are living factors, okay, things like animals um, eating it or animals trampling it. Abiotic is non-living. A control factor doesn't really exist in this situation. Water, because water is not living, it would be an abiotic factor. Question 2.3. Give two factors that might affect the number of buttercups growing on the field, but do not refer to water in your answer. So you can keep it open to biotic and abiotic factors, but what generally might affect the number of buttercups growing on the field? Well, there's loads of different things you could say on this one, okay? Plant is a plant, so it might need how much light there is, okay? Light intensity. You could say temperature, um, you could say uh, any herbivores or animals grazing. I'm just going to read out the list on this one because it's so long. Uh, trampling or mowing the lawn, uh, wind, you could have the soil pH or soil type, ions, minerals, nutrients in the soil, uh, any herbicides used, um, you're allowed to say pesticides, uh, or the amount of any other plants growing there. So competition, okay? So loads of different things you can say on that one. Complete the sentence. In this investigation, the number of buttercups in each quadrat was the blank variable. So think of your variables. Convert controls are what you keep the same. Dependent is what you measure. Independent is what you change. So, the number of buttercups in our quadrat, we were going around and we were counting them, so therefore it is our dependent variable, is what we were measuring. Okay? Figure 2 shows the quadrat on an area of the field, and then it says calculate the area of the quadrat. Now, this is when you need to trust your calculator. You do 0 0.5 times by 0 0.5, and that gives you an area of 0.25 and use the units that's given to you, 0.5 metres squared. So literally just times them together. The mean number of quadrats in one quad, the mean number of buttercups in one quadrat was eight. So it's already done the mean for you. Calculate the mean number of buttercups per metre squared. Okay, use your answer from question 2.5. So what you need to then do is that if we know that uh, my area was 0 0.25 meter squared in my quadrat, so I would do 8 divided by 0 0.25, and that would give me 32 um, buttercups uh, per meter squared, or you could have then also done 8 times 4, okay, because effectively you're taking your area, you're timesing it by 4. So therefore, your mean, you would also times by 4 as well. 8 times 4 is 32. Okay? Then, in another laboratory, uh, another group of students investigated the effect of soil acidity on the growth of beans. This is the method they used. They put the soil in a neutral pH with two large boxes. They acid, uh, added acid to the soil in one box. They planted some bean seeds in each um, box and they watered the seeds over three weeks. After three weeks, they measured the height of the bean plants in each box and they calculated the mean height of the bean plants in each box. Give two improvements the student could make uh, to make the method more or give more valid results. Okay, 
So what they've said here is a kind of basic method, but they haven't really included in it many um, units. Okay, so if we just go through, there's loads of things again you could say on this one. So put soil with a neutral pH into um, two large boxes. Well, my first question would be how much soil? Are they definitely getting the same mass of soil in grams? Add acid to the soil in one box. How much acid? Okay. How, how do you know how much they've added to the um, uh, soil? Do they then know the pH of the soil? Plant some seeds into each box. Again, how many seeds? What else are they giving the seeds? What about the water levels? What about the light intensity? Okay, so they've done a very rough method and you want to kind of break it apart. You could also go on about the same amount of seeds and the same um, spacing between them. How deep are they? Are they the same species? Okay, so loads of different things you could say here. So I might just say two improvements. They would have to use the same volume, use the same volume of water in each uh, box, uh, maybe, and give, you, give an example, maybe you're using 50 centimetre cubed of it, okay? Uh, then you could also say, have they got the, um, there's too many options to pick, um, have they used the same amount of soil? Okay, one kilogram. The other thing you they have missed off, but that is not clear, they have not also said about repeats. Okay, repeats allowing you to calculate a mean. So doing repeats would allow, say how many times you're repeating it, and that would give more valid results as well. So in terms of validity, you're looking at your control variables. Have they kept them the same? Have they not? The student then carried out the investigation, which is given here. So you've got the bean plants in acidic soil and neutral soil. It then says calculate mean value X in table one. So to calculate the mean, ta the mean in table one, you're, ju you're just doing the mean against the four. There doesn't look to be any obvious um, anomalies, okay? Because they're all relatively close together. Um, so you would just add them all up, which gives you a total of 70. And because it's over 5, 70 divided by 5 gives you a mean of 14 centimetres. What conclusion can the students make about the effect of acidic soil on the growth of the bean plants? Well, if we look at it, you've got neutral soil that has a mean of 14, but the acidic soil is only 7. So acid basically makes the plants grow less well. So a simple conclusion Bean plants grow less well in acidic soil. Okay, and it's only a one marker, so you can just leave it as that. Question number three then. The theory of evolution by natural selection was supported by Charles Darwin in 1859. Evidence from fossils supports Darwin's theory. Uh, what evidence supports the theory of evolution by natural selection? Is it knowledge of how DNA controls inheritance? Knowledge of how the dinosaurs became extinct? Knowledge of how the earth was formed? Or knowledge of what causes global warming? So basically, what evidence have we got that supports Darwin's theory of natural selection and how um, organisms evolve? Well... Dinosaurs wouldn't do that. Knowledge of just how the Earth is forming wouldn't do that. Global warming happening at the moment, that doesn't help us explain evolution. It's all about the DNA. Okay, so how has DNA changed of organisms over time? Figure three shows a fossil preserved in amber. The fossil formed when the amber solidified with the fly trapped inside. Why has the fly been preserved? So we've got this fly that is perfectly preserved in the amber. So why has it done that? 
Is it because the amber is kept at a constant temperature, the fly was soft bodied, uh, bodied or there was no oxygen in the amber? Well, the fly has not decayed or not decayed because in order to decay, you need oxygen. Okay, you need bacteria to be able to break it down and they need oxygen. So it's just the fact that there was no oxygen in the amber. Therefore, there's no decomposition. Okay. Figure four shows a simplified evolutionary tree for the insect group of animals. Okay, so you've got an evolutionary, evolutionary tree um, and you've got the present day insects. Which present day insects evolved first? So you've got to go way, so on this side of the diagram is when is millions of years ago, earliest, going to today. So what's the first organism from the list that is about today that evolved? Well, you start at the beginning and you can see actually it's the silverfish. The silverfish have been about for a very long time. Animals A, B, C and D were ancestors of present day insects. Which animal is the most recent ancestor of both gra grasshoppers and be beetles? A, B, C and D. So we're looking for grasshoppers and beetles. So if we go grasshoppers, we can trace it back. If we go beetles, we can trace it back. And where do they both meet? It would be on C. Okay, so that's the most common ancestor of those two organisms. Name the group of present day insects which have wings that do not fold. Okay, so go back to your um, diagram. Okay, so the ones that have wings that do not fold, well, we can see that we get told the wings become folded here. So everything from C and D onwards would have wings that do not fold, uh, do fold. So the only one that must have do not fold, so if we, this is wings becoming folded, this one is wings not folded. So it would be the dragonflies. The housefly has the binomial name Musca domestica. Okay, binomial names sound really complex. The Latin version of um, different organisms, but all you've got to remember is that the first bit of the word is the organism's genus, the second bit of the word is the species. I'll give you random um, examples you've never heard of before, but that's all you need to remember. What you then need to do is be able to, or table two shows part of the classification for a housefly. It then tells you to complete table two, choosing answers from the box here. Okay, so what kingdom does the housefly belong to? Well, it would be, probably one that makes probably most sense, is an animal. So it would be in the animal kingdom. Okay, so you just put in Animalia. Okay, copy it down. And then the class, well, I'm going to do the other bit first. From the binomial name, we know the first bit is the genus and the second bit is the species. And those are two of the box that are missing. So the first bit of our binomial name is our genus, so it would be Musca. And then the last bit, species Domestica. Okay, so those three have been used up. So the class would be Insecta. So just a little bit of a logic puzzle there. Carl Woos uh, proposed the three domain system of classification. Which domain are insects in? Well, insects are animals. And we know animal cells, they are eukaryotes. So remember, Carl Woos said everything can be broken down into three things. The eukaryotes, cells with a nucleus, prokaryotes, cells without a nucleus, and archaea are basically the extremophiles, 
the real basic bacteria from um, when the earth was first formed or living really extreme environments okay so eukaryotes prokaryotes true bacteria and archaea right question four then the endocrine system is made up of glands which secrete hormones figure five shows the position of the endocrine glands in the human body so you've got a b c and d so what i would do if i get a diagram like this is try and um, uh, label it before um, I even get to the answers. So A, I know they're the glands. The gland in the brain is called the pituitary gland. B, the one in your throat area is called your thyroid gland. The ones on top of your kidneys are called your adrenal glands. And then D, kind of uh, leaf-shaped organ, is in your digestive system, but not the liver, sorry, it is the pancreas, which is responsible for all of your enzymes as well. So which letter shows the pancreas? It would be D. Which letter shows the thyroid gland? As I said, labelled them all, it's one of the throat area, which is B. Hormones travel from the gland where they are made to the target organ where they have an effect. How do hormones travel from the gland to the target organ? So how do hormones get around our body? They travel in the bloodstream. Okay, you can just say actually just blood. Okay, and that's fine. When blood glucose concentration becomes too high, hormone X from the pancreas causes a decrease in glucose concentration. Name hormone X. So it's what hormone actually brings down your blood glucose levels. And you've just got to know the pancreas makes insulin that does that. In what two ways does hormone X, insulin, cause a decrease in blood glucose concentration? OK, so you've got to say what are the two ways in which glucose is taken out of the blood? Glucose is broken down. Uh, probably not quite scientific enough or clear enough reason. I've got to say the, the insulin itself does not break glucose down. Glucose is converted to glycogen. Well, that is true. That happens in the liver. So glucose gets converted into glycogen in the liver. So it's no longer in the blood. It's not excreted by the kidneys. Um, and it can also be moved into our cells. So Insulin encourages our cells to take up more glucose so it moves out of the blood into our cells and we can use it in respiration. It does not move into the small intestine, so it'd be those two points there. Figure six shows the blood glucose concentration in a woman. Okay, so you've got the time of day and the blood glucose concentration. Okay, and it's plotted for blind for a woman and it hasn't done it for a man. Suggest what time of day the woman ate her breakfast of sugar-coated cereal. So you can see here that the woman had a relatively consistent blood glucose level and then it shot up. So we can assume, well, that's because she's ate all of that cereal. So what time do we think she did it? Well, it would be before it starts going up. So it would be about, just before it starts going up, about 8.30ish. Okay. You're actually allowed any time between 8.15 and 8.35, okay? So any time in that area. The man in figure six has type 2 diabetes and he has not been treated. So the man ate the same type and amount of breakfast cereal as the woman and ate at the same, same time as the woman. Suggest what his blood glucose concentration would be at 9 o'clock. So it's just saying suggest, okay? Now, if he's not been treated for it and he's had a um, uh, blood sugar or more sugar put into the blood, starts off low, it would then shoot up higher. Now, it could be, and we don't know um, how high it will go. This is why it's just a suggest question. So you are allowed any region between 6.5 to 20 millimoles per decimeter cubed. So literally, you can start off here, um, as long as you know, recognise the fact it's gone higher from this point, you can go any number 
I would I would have just gone eight to be honest. But you're allowed six point five to twenty. The man is an office worker. He does not exercise and he eats sugary snacks at his desk. Give two lifestyle changes a doctor might recommend to the man to help control his diabetes. Okay, well, it's giving you bullet points here, so I would um, uh, refer to these points exactly. And if he's obese, to help control diabetes, it's better not to be obese. So it's to reduce body mass, or you could say lose weight. You could also say he does not exercise, so therefore he should exercise. Okay, literally giving you the information straight from it. You could also say, because it's giving you sh eating sugary snacks. Now on this one, um, just saying healthy diet or having a healthier diet is not enough. You've got to say eat low calorie food, okay? Or less sugary food. You can't just say healthy diet, specifically link it back to sugar because that is blood glucose levels, because that's what diabetes is about. Describe how a low blood glucose concentration would lead to a person feeling weak. Well, if they've got low blood glucose levels, okay, what is the glucose actually used for in our body? Well, glucose is important for respiration. So with less glucose, if you have less glucose, means less respiration. If you have less respiration, respiration is what gives us energy. Less respiration means the person has less energy. Therefore, feeling weak. Okay, so your two point key points are less respiration and therefore having less energy. Right, question five then. This question is about the cycling of water and carbon in ecosystems. Which reaction produces water? Well, you've got your three equations here. You should be thinking produces water, but it's not going to be photosynthesis because plants take in water. That's a reactant. So it's between aerobic and anaerobic respiration. And hopefully you remember glucose plus oxygen makes CO2 and water vapour. Anaerobic respiration is the one that makes lactic acid. Okay, so it would be aerobic respiration, the one that we do most of the time, all of the time. The water cycle provides water for plants and animals on land before the water goes into lakes and seas. And you've got these different labels here. And it says name processes one to five on figure seven. So I'm just gonna do it on this diagram, but obviously you'd write it into the main spaces. And this is just knowing your water cycle. But if you've got the sun shining down on the water, the water can evaporate. So number one is evaporate. The water vapor has been evaporated and then it can condense and forms the clouds. The clouds, liquid water, then falls back to earth and that is called precipitation. So evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and then the water lands back on the earth. Now the water can then either be absorbed and go through a plant back into the atmosphere or it can end up in the body of water in which it started or the sea or a lake or a river so number four we tend to call surface runoff so you could say runoff or percol percolation which is the movement of water through soil or you could even say drainage so it's the water running through the soil Five uh, is the process you actually met in biology paper one, movement of water through a plant 
it's called a transpiration. Remember the transpiration stream going up through the xylem in a plant. Okay, so those are your different answers there. One, two, three, and five, very precise, have one word. There are several words that you could use for um, number four. So in 2007, the population of the world was six, uh, well, six, got nine zeros there, so six billion. A study found that 4.5% of the population had severe water shortage. Give how many people had severe water shortage and give your answer in standard form. Okay, so I would personally find I've got six um, billion, so six and nine zeros. Divided by 100, that would give me 1%, times by 4.5 to give me 4.5%. That gives me 270 million. Now, if I got to that point, that would be um, two marks, but it wants it in standard form. So remember, standard form always has to be between 1 and 10. So you'd have to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 six, seven, eight, so it would be 2.7 times 10 to the power of eight um, in standard form, okay? Question 5.4 then, why do more people have severe water shortage now than in 2007? Well, climate change has increased the area of deserts, um, well that would make sense, so I'll have a think about that one, but yeah, that makes sense. Each person drinks less water. Well, that's not true. More water is used to grow crops. Well, if there's more people now, um, there'll be more crops growing. That could be right. Sea levels have risen because ice caps are melting. Well, if there's more sea, that wouldn't cause a water shortage. And then some countries have be built desalting factories for sea, wa for sea water. Well, that wouldn't... Um, decrease the amount of water available that would actually increase it so therefore it must be climate change has made more areas of deserts desertification and more water is being used to grow crops because there's more people there leaves on a tree contain carbon compounds in the autumn the leaves fall to the ground Microorganisms in the soil recycle carbon from the leaves, so the carbon is used for new plant growth. Explain how. So this is a question linking to, obviously, the carbon cycle. And it's saying that you've got microorganisms in the soil are taking the carbon from the leaves that have effectively died, and then it can be used for new plant growth. Explain how. So this is, this is a tricky question, so you've got to think about um, one specific pair area of the carbon cycle. So what happens is the dead leaves okay, fall to the ground and decay. So that carbon that was in the leaf has fallen to the ground and has decayed by microorganisms. Okay, that would be my first point. In fact, actually saying that, that would get, um, if, you, if I said, for example, bacteria, that would be enough to get two marks. The microorganisms respire as they break down carbon into um, and as they break down the carbon they produce CO2 so the carbon dioxide has then gone back into the atmosphere new plants or growing plants absorb CO2 for photosynthesis which converts that CO2 into glucose. OK, 
Okay, so it is quite specific, this one. The dead leaves fall to the ground and are broken down uh, by microorganisms. So all that carbon is then being broken down by the microorganisms. The microorganisms then respire, then puts that CO2 back into the atmosphere, and then the new plants take it in, which is where the new plant growth take, uh, comes from, and it's the process of photosynthesis. Then, question 5.6, what is the benef one benefit of fallen leaves for living plants? So, why do, what's a good thing for plants um, having dead leaves fall on them? Energy is released for living plants, mm, not just because you've got dead stuff falling on it, no. Insect pests in the soil are killed, not by dead leaves, no. Nitrates are released into the soil, mm, maybe. And then oxygen is supplied to root cells. Oh no, that can't be right. Dead leaves don't, don't produce oxygen. So therefore, um, it must be nitrates are therefore released into the soil. Okay, so you can do a bit of process of elimination on that one. Last question on this paper then is question six. Water pollution is a problem for humans and wildlife. Explain how human activities are polluting rivers, lakes and seas. OK, so in order to get six marks on this, you have to make sure we've got some relative points and they're given and they're logically linked to form a clear account. OK, and because it has specifically mentioned rivers, lakes and seas, I would be breaking it down into that sort of um, area. And we need to think of everything that is then polluting them. So what are we doing that is polluting them? Well, the first thing that would come to mind in my mind would be sewage. We are polluting and putting loads of sewage into rivers, lakes and seas. And where is that coming from? Well, it's coming from um, uh, agriculture. Okay, and then we've got waste overflow from homes. And also industry. So big companies, etc. There's a lot of news at the moment about when there's too much rain, loads of water companies are putting loads of uh, waste. They can't process all of that water, so they're dumping some sewage water back into the environment, which is obviously very bad. Now, the issue is putting all of this sewage into the um, water. It causes something called eutrophication. Now, this is very specific knowledge. But eutrophication is when um, too much fertilizer or sewage is put into water. So too much sewage or fertilizer ends up in a river or lake. What the, this can cause is the microorganisms, um, or sorry, it might cause too much algae to then grow. So if you've got loads of fertilizer ending up in the lake, this causes algae to grow really fast. Now, algae, if you imagine a lake, okay, it's then got a layer of algae plants growing on top. What does that mean? Well, it stops any light going down below to the sea or lake or river to the seabed. So what this then means, because we've got too much fertilizer causing too much algae, the algae blocks sunlight to the river or lake bed. This then causes the plants at the bottom of the lake to die because they can't photosynthesize. This causes the plants near the bottom to die and decompose. The 
for bacteria res respire in the lake and decompose the dead plants. This respiration then uses up loads of oxygen. This uses up oxygen. And therefore, because it uses up oxygen, it means all the other organisms, like the fish, then die. This causes fish and other animals to die. If you're not familiar with the con uh, concept of eutrophication, if ever they talk about water pollution, this is the one you need to be talking about, make sure you go back and watch the whole Cognito video on that. But these are kind of the key points that you need to be saying um, for it. So if you answer eutrophication in detail, then that would get you an awful lot of marks. You could then also say, what are the other things we're doing that is polluting seas and etc.? Well, we, it's obviously a few years ago, but there's an awful lot, lot about plastics, okay? Damaging sea life, building up because it's not biodegradable. Okay? Um, and then you could say any, um, uh, obviously that builds up in the animals. And harms them. And then you could talk more generally about just general pollution going into the lakes and rivers. It might be um, chemicals from factories, okay, that could cause mutations. In organisms, OK, and you could also then talk about potentially even oil spills. That is another way that we are damaging, which obviously kills wildlife. So in this question, it is sometimes it's quite a hard question, these kind of very open ones, because you can take it in so many different directions. But personally, any time it's talking about water pollution, you need to be talking about eutrophication um, and how it uses up and takes all the oxygen out of the water and therefore stops any other organisms living in it, basically. OK, and that is the end of that paper. OK, so Biology Paper 2 in 2022, um, the Foundation Tier paper. Um, yep, so make sure if you weren't sure on any of those questions, you look at the YouTube uh, Cognito links and I will um, uh, make sure that they're on the, on the comment section below. Uh, hope it was useful. Many thanks.